like our uh, our next speaker, uh, Ann Logan, uh, from uh, the Great Basin Unified uh, Control District, uh, has her uh, presentation up, and so she's rapidly advancing up to the uh, front of the room. And again, uh, although we're running behind, uh, please take your full 15 minutes uh, for the presentation. Good morning, I'm Ann Logan, the Deputy Air Pollution Control Officer for Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control District. And I am going to um, pick up where Phil and Grace left off. And the history of Owens Lake and the district is really critical to understand where we are today, but I'm going to focus on um, the current dust control status and current regulatory framework uh, under which the dis district operates um, its monitoring and enforcement activities. So to provide kind of the simplest overview of the current regulatory framework, um, still provided the history of all the different iterations of SIPs and supplemental control requirement determinations that have been, the district has been through. Um, the current regulatory framework really consists of two main components. And the first is the control plan. And that's contained in the 2016 Owen Valley Planning Area State Implementation Plan. And that provides the overview of the control strategy to attain the federal PM10 standards. The legal requirements and enforce, enforcement mechanisms for that plan are contained in three primary regulatory documents, well, two, um, both that being the District Governing Board Order 1604-1301 and District Rule 433. Um, both the 2016 SIP and District Rule 433 were approved by EPA. And California Health and Safety Code 42316, um, which was originated in 1983, um, provides that the district can require the City of Los Angeles to undertake reasonable measures to mitigate air quality impacts of its activities for production, diversion, storage, and conveyance of water. Grace covered the history of dust control development, and currently um, the three main backums are shallow flooding, managed vegetation, and gravel, with provisions in shallow flooding for tillage and brine. It's important to note um, that the dust control season for Owens Lake, for which the requirements of these backum need to be met, is October 16th to June 30th. It isn't the full year. And the current dust control status um, for these backum include about five square miles of gravel and backum managed vegetation. Shallow flooding has the largest acreage with almost 30 square miles. Um, shallow flooding can be operated in several different ways by DWP, including shallow flood, flooding ponds and sprinklers. There's about three square miles of brine and tillage. And there are some additional provisions for minimum dust control efficiency areas, which are reduced control efficiencies that are allowed in specific areas. And also, of the 48.9 square miles of dust control that have been ordered, um, 1.2 square miles of that have been deferred. So in 2013, um, the city and district agreed upon provisions that allowed for areas with significant environmental and cultural resources that met specific provisions to be deferred for dust control. And we have just over one square mile of those areas today. The 47 plus square miles of dust control that are in existence today um, require a lot of oversight. So LA Department of Water and Power is responsible for the operations and maintenance and the district is responsible for the monitoring and enforcement of these best available control <coughs> measures. The district's activities are really separated into two main components and that is ambient air quality monitoring, the primary purpose of which is to determine compliance with the federal PM10 standards 
There's also the goal to meet the California ambient air quality standard for PM10 in communities within the Owens Valley PM10 planning area. And with that ambient air quality monitoring, the district also does an annual monitor, modeling with CalPUF uh, that's used in an evaluation of monitored and modeled exceedances for contingency determination for additional control areas. Um, a tertiary part of our ambient air quality monitoring is to issue health alerts and provide real-time data to the public. And the second part of the district's monitoring is focused on the best available control measures, compliance monitoring, and evaluation. <clears throat> and that's to ensure that the dust controls are installed and operated to the required design and performance criteria. And this is a transition. So over the past several decades, the district's primary focus was really in identifying the source areas that needed control. And as dust control has been implemented, there's been a transition to the primary focus of staff being on the monitoring and compliance evaluations of the dust controls. The network on Owens Lake for ambient air quality monitoring um, is shown here, and this includes PM10 and PM2.5 monitors that are operated by both the district and LADWP. Um, it's important to note that the compliance with the federal and state standards is only uh, at the regulatory shoreline through district monitors. Um, the additional LADWP sites are used for performance criteria for the backup, but aren't used in evaluating compliance with the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. And the map, I won't go into the, the details of the monitoring sites, but it's just to show that given the large area of the lake, um, there's significant PM10 monitoring. The district has 10 sites, um, and DWP operates, I think, currently right now an additional four. Another part of the district's monitoring program is the dust identification program. And this is a method that was determined to monitor sand flux. It um, involves both the um, collection of sand mass as well as a time resolution of that mass. And it was originally developed to estimate PM10 emissions and um, correspond those to source areas for that needed control. It's evolved to become a performance criteria for specific types of backup, including tillage, brine, and dynamic water management. And currently there are about 300 sites across Owens Lake um, that are used both in monitoring areas that might need additional controls as well as the performance criteria for areas that are currently under control. And sites are operated by both the city and the district. Additional monitoring that's done by the district includes field observations, um, source area mapping of areas that become emissive that are outside of currently controlled areas, surface integrity observations, as well as uh, imagery and analysis, including LIDAR, um, UAVs, and satellite. We, the district has developed a way to um, induce emissions using a drone, and the procedures of that um, are contained in regulatory documents, and it's referred to as induced particle emissions test. The district also operates a network of remote dust cameras to track dust emissions during daylight hours. And so if we look at the different best available control measures, um, this is a superficial overview of the compliance criteria for those backup. And the purpose of this slide is really not to go into the details of that compliance criteria, but to highlight that there are specific performance criteria for each backup, and those need to have measurable performance criteria that the district can track and evaluate to ensure the control efficiencies of those best available control measures. And so you'll see for each of the backup, um, several of them have multiple types of performance criteria that are tracked, where others have um, just a single criteria that's evaluated. And in the evaluations of those backums, the 
Frequency really depends on the type of criteria. So certain dust controls are more subject to rapid change than others. Um, for shallow flooding, the district evaluating the compliance criteria every eight days provided there's a clear satellite overpass because wetness can change very quickly. Things like brine or vegetation are evaluated more on an annual basis. Um, and then surface evaluation, tillage, sand flux monitoring, a lot of that is continuous or as needed. And the district works proactively and cooperatively with LADWP, both in the um, monitoring as well as in the performance evaluations. And a lot of work is done to ensure that uh, both entities are proactive in ensuring the compliance criteria. The district has the authority to take enforcement actions if performance criteria are not met, including ordering refloods of areas, issuing NOVs or N NTCs, um, unless the reason the performance criteria are not met is due to um, a breakdown condition or something that would el be eligible for a variance under the district's procedures, um, which would be issued by our hearing board. And so where I'll end is um, the Owen Valley PM10 planning area has not met the federal PM10 standard in a demonstration of attainment. And so on an annual basis, uh, determination is done by the district of the monitored and modeled PM10 exceedances um, to determine if additional areas are required for controls and also to ensure that the currently implemented best available control measures are sufficiently controlling PM10 emissions. And this contingency requirement um, is a requirement by the 1990 Clean Air Amendment um, Act, which requires that progress be made towards attainment of the federal standard. So that was a brief overview of the district's current monitoring and enforcement activities. I think Jennifer Wong is coming to provide DWP's side. And can I just confirm that both of you will be able to stay through the afternoon for our question session, um, which is currently scheduled uh, at 1.35? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Jennifer Wong. I'm the manager of the Old Lake Engineering Group. So we make up about 10 engineers that uh, comprise of electrical, mechanical, and civil engineers, as well as draft, a drafting technician. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, next time I should go before Jaime because he kind of stole some of my thunder and <laughs> my pictures and some of my slides is also maybe a little bit repetitive, so I apologize for that. Uh, but anyway, but my group is responsible for supporting all the operations and maintenance on the Owens Lake. So at the lake, we have about 50 construction, maintenance, an operator, operator staff there, and um, and basically I am going to basically here's an agenda. I've been asked to basically give an overview of kind of like who we are at the Owen Lake. I'm actually based up at the Keeler Construction Yard. Uh, my husband and I actually both work for the department up there. It's been a year and a half or so that I've assumed my new role as the manager of the Owens Lake Engineering Group. But previously, I had worked for a total of seven years on Owens Lake dust mitigation projects. Previously, I was working more on the regulatory side of things, special studies and research, that sort of thing. And then now I'm transitioned over to the O&M side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically go over um, kind of who we are, um, who's at the lake, what are the supporting groups. I'm also going to give kind of an overview of the infrastructure that supports each of the different backroom types. I'm going to talk a little bit about our operations as well as the maintenance, maintenance activities that we have to do to support our dust mitigation efforts there. And then I'm also going to end with um, an overview of kind of the operational constraints and challenges that we face. And that's something that Jaime was kind of touching upon, and I'll probably just expand a little bit more on that. So in terms of who we are, so like I mentioned, uh, my group is comprised about well nine engineers, including myself. I'm a civil engineering background. Um, we have about 50 or so staff guys out there who on a daily basis are basically monitoring the health of the lake. 
I mean, are areas like wet enough? Uh, how are our plants doing? Um, are there any leaks? It's a, it's a continuous 24 seven type of operation. We have hydrographers out there basically that are responsible for coming up with the irrigation scheduling to help make ensure that areas stay compliant. They're also in charge of basically spreading the water allocations to the different air shallow flood areas, uh, not only for operational needs, but also to assist with uh, salinity management associated with habitat value. Um, and then all, we also have an electrical mechanic shop that's responsible for maintaining power to all our facilities, not only at the lake, but the entire aqueduct. And then basically from LA all the way up to Bishop, uh, we have, we rely a lot on other engineering groups, fleet to get our equipment, survey to help us make sure we are working within the boundaries that we should, uh, supplemental construction staff, and of course we put out a lot of contracts for materials and that sort of thing. And then we also have to deal a lot with the other groups, real estate, legal, corporate, environmental, on the permitting side of things. Um, in terms of assets, so Jaime kind of talked a little bit about this already, but this slide basically gives a brief overview of those assets, of what we're actually responsible for, and then of course what we rely on to attain and maintain compliance of all of our dust mitigation areas. So we have about 31.8 miles of zonal mainline pipe. And what zonal mainline pipe is, that's our primary water supply pipeline that takes water to all areas around the lake. And so we have three sources of water that we pull into our zonal mainline. That's uh, one of which the Los Angeles Aqueduct. On the north end, it's Lubkin. On the south end, it's from Cartago. And then we also have up in the north, off the Lower Owens River, we pump up to 50 CFS um, through our Lower Owens River pump back station. So those are basically the three sources of water that feed the zonal mainline that basically is a continuous loop all around the whole entire perimeter of the lake bed. Um, and then we have 35 turnout facilities. So the turnout basically allow us to pull water from that zonal mainline into an individual dust control area. And at the turnout facilities, we have filtration systems to help, you know, get rid of the majority of like the sediment and organics that are present in that raw aqueduct water that we're pulling from, from the river as well as from the aqueduct. And then um, there's cathodic protection because as Jaime mentioned, we have very saline soil conditions at the lake. So we have to protect all our buried metal piping, you know, fittings, all that, all that, all that good stuff. Um, and then there's all of the uh, controls and instrumentation for the automatic kind of controls um, on operating the lake. So for the most part, I like to say that most of the lake can be operated through our SCADA system, but there are certain areas and portions of areas that are manually controlled. So we actually have to have our guys go out there, manually open the valves here and there at times. And especially for like dust mitigation and for compliance reasons, there may, may be a need to maybe operate areas more or less. And sometimes, you know, you have to go there. If you want to isolate an area, the guys will have to go out there and do it by hand. In terms of like the piping, uh, the water supply lines that we have that are two inch or greater, we have 4,200 miles of it. And as Jaime mentioned in our farm, which is the uh, managed veg areas T5 through T8, we have 35, or actually 30, so 35, 3600 miles of subsurface drip tube irrigation. Um, in terms of berm, as Jaime mentioned, we have about 128 uh, miles of berm roads. Um, and um, actually, it's funny because even for me, even being there for about a year and a half full time, I still kind of lose my way around sometimes. But I hear Google Maps works wonders. So for you guys who, when you guys finally go there, you might want to make sure you charge your phone and have that ready. <laughs> Okay, so now with that, okay, so now I'm going to kind of transition and try to give an overview of the type of infrastructure related to the different backup types. So I'll go ahead and start with shallow flood backup. So like, like other folks mentioned, you know, for shallow flood, you can have ponds, you can have lateral shallow flooding, and as Jaime mentioned, there's bubblers, which is, um, which is, okay, I don't know, pointer, I'm sorry, but it's the top left. And then up here, we have an example of a above ground sprinkler in our channel area. Um, up here to the very top, that's an example of our drainage system. We have pumps there. It's like a little mini pump stations that we can recirculate surface or subsurface water within that area. Um, and in some areas, we actually have the capability of pumping into a, what we call a brine line conveyance system. And what that allows us to do is be able to move water to, and distribute water to different parts of the area depending on operational need and um, especially related to habitat values and salinity management. Um, down here, um, ever so often, once in, once in a while, we should have a leak, 
And so this is an example of a shoring system that we had to install. Um, um, shoring system we had installed to be able to access the area. And then the picture to the bottom left is an example of our filtration system that I just mentioned. So basically, as water comes up and out um, from the from the main line, from the zonal main line to the turnout station, it actually goes through a series of, of, of sand separators and, and brush filters. So basically, the sand separators allow the heavy sediment to basically fall out from the water, and then it goes through brush filters, which basically helps remove most of the organics, like the leaves, the twigs, um, algae. And so we especially notice actually during the runoff season and when there's higher temperatures, there'll be a lot more algae bloom, a lot more organics present in our um, in our system. And that could be a problem because depending on the volume of sediments that are going through our system, obviously that could clog and then overrun um, our filtration system and then make its way further down the system and then leads to clogging and plugging of sprinklers and that sort of thing. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. But in terms of pond shallow flood, so we have um, um, higher perimeter berms around those areas simply because we're having to hold back more water. And, and the side slopes are, gener are generally rip wrapped. Um, that's to help prevent soil erosion from the wave action. Um, for the lateral shallow flood, like bubblers or sprinkler areas, we, we have obviously lower, like shorter berms because it's not necessary. We're not holding back you know, a bunch of water. Um, and typically, um, those have extensive pipeline distribution network, like I said, of bubblers or, or sprinklers. Um, in terms of operations of shallow flood areas, so basically, we run those areas through irrigation schedule uh, through our SCADA system that's maintained by my engineering group. Um, and those schedules are set by our hydrographers in coordination with the watershed resource folks and biologists. Uh, up in Bishop, as well as on the lake, uh, just depending on uh, you know what the need is, time of year, weather conditions obviously have a big effect on if we have to run areas a little bit more or less. If there's rain out there, then we can back off a little bit on that. So it's very a dynamic process that they adjust those irrigation schedules. And out in the field um, and in the skater room, that's all operated by our uh, aqueduct and reservoir keepers. Um, so in terms of maintenance action or maintenance activities, I should say, I'm sorry, related to shallow flooding, um, just really in terms of everyday maintenance, a lot of it's dictated by what our guys see out in the field. Um, and so it could include things like cleaning out sprinkler heads or replacing sprinkler heads because the sprinklers have seized because of all the salt and it's preventing the sprinklers from being able to rotate, that sort of thing. Or sometimes they need to unplug or replace the sprinklers or bubbler heads uh, because they're clogged or damaged um, due to sediment getting caught in it. Or if construction has just ended, sometimes because they're HDP lines, sometimes those shavings from just the fusing process, it'll actually end up in plugging our sprinklers as well. So things like that, it's always, it's like, a, like I said, a 24-7 thing where the guys have to be aware of, of the areas and know what's going on there. And just to give a little context to the magnitude of what they deal with, we have over 38,000 sprinklers um, spread over those, you know, 32 square miles, well actually 48 square miles that we've mitigated to date. So it just shows you what a big tall order that really is for our guys. Um, other parts, other maintenance activities could include just flushing the lines too, to try to clear up that sediment and organics that tend to settle at the bottom of the, the piping, um, and so we have a series of blow-off valves, clean-out, flush valves, flushing mechanisms to help remove that sediment. Okay, now I'm going to move on to tillage. In terms of tillage of um, the infrastructure, so, so tillage and brine all at one point were shallow flood back of areas. So they're going to have, obviously, that same infrastructure there. But the difference, though, with, with, with tillage areas, obviously, you're not going to have those sprinkler irrigation systems um, um, you know, as, per, as permanent infrastructure. You're going to have outfalls, possibly, or you're going to have bubblers. And so um, we also have a way of, of deploying a temporary irrigation system if, if needed for maintenance or reflood orders. Um, and in terms of operations and maintenance of these areas, really tillage is one of our, you know, if we're not doing our maintenance or we're not ha having to deal with a reflood order, um, tillage is a waterless death mitigation measure. So it's one of those things where it's a leave it and forget it. 
until maybe you have to do some maintenance or some other action in that area. Um, so the only time you know we really have to do anything, and depending on what we're trying to achieve, like I said, is if we want to do some preemptive maintenance, or if the district is asking us to do maintenance, or if they give us a refloat order. And what those actions may include uh, may include tilling the inner furrows. So we have the furrows here, um, and sometimes um, they fill with sand that either could come out from another area, like sand intrusion from another area, or for whatever reason, and 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 the and we need and because of the way that the district measures like ridge heights and things like that, we'll actually run our bolt plows down the existing alignment of the existing furrow to push up and out that collected soil up on top of the ridge to build up that ridge height. So that's another way uh, we would do maintenance. Or another way would be between the ridges. So like this area here, you can actually take your equipment through that same area and actually put in some more tillage rows. So there's a couple of different ways. Or what we could do is we could actually level the entire area and then reestablish tillage. Or level it, reflood it, and then and then reestablish tillage. And so some of these pictures, just up at the top left, you see a series of equipment with the switch plow. We refer to that as tillageddon, um, just because you just had all that equipment all at one time out there trying to roughen up that surface. And that generally is what our first step is. You want to roughen up the surface. And then what you want to do Next is you want to go back through in the opposite perpendicular direction and then you want to with the bull plow and then that's when you'll start seeing like these type of deep furrows you see at the bottom right. And up top that picture probably looks familiar because I may have it but basically you want to have that serpentine sinuous kind of like shape. Um, um, so that's ideal what it should look like. And um, Anne talked about the IPET testing. So the picture in the top middle, that's our ex aqueduct manager who's since retired and Nick. Um, and they're basically with that drone conducting the IPET test. Okay, so in terms of brine, as I mentioned before, because it was once a shallow flood area, it's gonna have very similar infrastructure. Um, but with this one, you're not gonna have bubblers or sprinklers, you're just gonna have a series of outfalls to help supply water to the area. Um, so in terms of operations and maintenance of brine areas, this is another pretty simple bathroom in that sense, where it's a leave it and forget it dust mitigation measure to us. Um, and if we were to have to do some type of maintenance or if we were issued a reflood, simply all we have to do is turn on the faucet. So we turn on those outfalls, flood the area, let nature do its job so it can reestablish that crust layer that we're looking for. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much it. Or actually, and then the other thing that we could possibly do too as part of maintenance, if we're trying to distribute the water to all areas within that brine area, we can actually put in some cross hatching, like little channels to basically move that water to all the to, to, all, to the whole area that we're trying to work with. Um, so in terms of like these pictures, like the very top left, that's a picture of a stuck excavator that broke that hard top crust of a brine area. Um, and you see how muddy and mucky it is, it's not, not fun. Um, the bottom right picture, I think Grace might have this photo, but it's a pretty cool photo. Um, and I just wanted to say that actually the color of the brine, it can take on many different colors. And what kind of dictates that is the composition and the type of bacteria that's present in the brine solution. And then the picture to the bottom uh, left is actually, it shows the unique kind of crystalline structure of the salts that naturally occur um, underneath that brine, brine crust. Okay, so in terms of managed veg, this was supposed to be funny, I didn't hear any laugh, but okay, so I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of a city folk. I, I grew up in Pasadena, Whittier area, so I've never actually seen a gopher in my life. So the, when I went up to the Owens Lake, Sorry, Adam. So when I went up to Owens Lake, one of the first questions I asked the guys, I'm like, what are some of the major maintenance issues that you guys have, you know, in, in management areas? And they said, well, actually, gophers. Gophers pose quite a bit of trouble uh, to us. They're kind of a maintenance nightmare. I was like, oh, really? Why? What's going on? Well, what happens is these little critters, so, so this is what I thought they looked like, and this is reality what they look like. So cute, cuddly, and caddy shack. Here, maybe still cute, but maybe not really where I want it. Want to pet it, but but anyway, basically what these guys do is they burrow in their and create a tunnel network in our uh, veg areas. And when I told you that we had 3,600 uh, miles of drip, subsurface drip tube irrigation, well, they basically burrow through that irrigation 
um, um, lines that we have. And so what we end up with is kind of a very bad version of the Bellagio water show in Vegas. You know, you see a lot of water, but just without the lights and sound. Uh, but then, of course, then we have to deal with all those leak repairs. So that's not so fun. But, um, but kind of in talking with that managed veg area in the south that I was telling you about from T5 to T8, only in those locations do we have permanent fertigation stations. And so the bottom left picture kind of shows you what those tanks that the station looks like. You'll see a bunch of tanks that we hold the chemical. We basically use it as we go, but uh, twice a year, spring and fall, we apply the fertilizer, liquid fertilizer through our irrigation system. And that's to keep the uh, plants happy and healthy. And so up top is an example of a happy and healthy uh, established uh, managed veg area. So in terms of infrastructure, I mean, once again, this is going to be very similar to shallow floods simply because we have to irrigate these areas, right? So, but there is a little bit difference in terms of infrastructure, especially for like the newer phase 7A, 9, 10 managed veg areas, is that you'll have a uh, raised broad bed. And that provides kind of like a drained, low salinity zone for those plants to kind of grow, thrive, and not have their root zone burn because of any salt. Um, that are being reclaimed from that area. And then in between these broadbeds, what you'll find are furrows that go between those broadbeds. And that facilitates kind of like the distribution of irrigation water, as well as helping remove the, um, the salt from those reclaimed, uh, reclaimed uh, reclamation activities, I should say. Um, and then, um, and yeah, just, just like the shallow flood, we have subsurface, surface drainage systems. Um, and in the farm, uh, T5 through T8, that is a little bit different than the 7A, 9, 10 areas in that um, not only do we have filtration at the turnout station, but we also have secondary filters out in the field. And that's just because of the different systems, the drip tube versus the above ground sprinklers uh, that we have in the uh, base 7A, 9, 10 bench areas. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I guess I didn't mention about the maintenance activities. So, well, the maintenance activities, I kind of jumped ahead. So, the fertigation or application of fertilizers through our irrigation system, referred to as fertigation, that is something that's part of our, our uh, maintenance program, as well as obviously the upkeep of our water conveyance system um, and, um, of course, the, any repair, leak repairs that we have to deal with just because of the gophers. In terms of gravel, infrastructure is, is really simple. All you have um, basically is you have underlying geofabrics, which in that bottom left picture, you see the, the black. So that's the geotextile uh, fabric, and then rock is basically applied over it of uh, two to four inches. And so the other pictures that you see here are some of the different tools that we use as part of our maintenance activities. So the very top left photo, you see that department truck. What, what, what it's dragging is what we call a chain harrow. And a chain harrow simply looks like a section of chain link fence with tines, um, which are like sharp teeth, I guess. I guess you could call it like that. And you basically drag it over the top surface of a gravel area. And what ends up happening is the rock comes up top, and then the sand will drop underneath that. And so as you can see in the picture, there's like a little section where you see that it's inundated with sand, and then the adjacent areas, you see that it doesn't look the same. Well, that's because you, we dragged it with the chain harrow. And then the other picture that you see to like the top right um, and the bottom right are two different pieces of equipment that we um, have either uh, designed and fabricated ourselves. Actually, the pump shop has, led by John Hunter, um, so the bottom right photo shows that type of tractor equipment that he, him and his guys came up with um, to help with the gravel maintenance. The one up top is actually a commercial piece of equipment that's actually used to clean beaches, actually. But it actually was quite effective. Uh, the only thing, it, it, it ran kind of slow, but that is an option to us uh, for maintenance activities. Um, and then in terms of permanent sand <coughs> fencing, um, this is kind of a unique one. Um, we have about 20,000 linear feet of five foot tan sand fence, sand fence that we have installed out there. And basically all it's composed of, you know, in the bottom right you see a, a wooden post with some bird spikes on top. And that's just to prevent um, perching of predatory birds. And then you see to the right, there's a huge aerial photo, just like an overview of, of T1A1. And you see that the, the, the sand fencing is oriented um, to protect against the predominant wind direction. And there's also gaps within the panels of sand fence, as well as underneath the sand fence material, as you can see in the top left. And that's to, that's 
as to allow wildlife access through the area. And so basically maintenance and the operations, there's really nothing that we have to do other than once it's installed, you know, just let it be. Um, maintenance, um, just making sure that if there's ever damaged sections and panels of sand fence that we replace that. Sometimes with the high winds, it brings in trash or tumbleweeds and things like that to the area. Plus we have extreme weather conditions, so the really intense UV rays will kind of deteriorate that material over time. So actually a couple years ago, we ended up replacing the entire 20,000 linear feet uh, of it. Of it. And then the last slide that I wanted to share with you guys or talk about, I'm sorry, is about the operational constraints and challenges that we face as a lake. Um, I, I think like a lot of the issues that we deal with are actually because of reasons that we really have no control over and that's environmental conditions. And that includes like presence of those organics and sediment that I was talking about in that raw aqueduct water that we pull into our zonal main lines. It's the saline soil conditions. Um, and it's the extreme and harsh weather conditions in terms of rain and temperatures and all that that we deal with. So I think that this slide kind of best describes, demonstrates, I'm sorry, some of the challenges that we face. So actually in the top left, you'll see two photos of before and after. And this is of a gravel area, T32-2. And in a two week period of time, I don't know if you can tell, but you can see that on the right side, the two weeks later, you'll see an area kind of like a like a light gray uh, portion of it. That's sand inundation. So and that's just over a two week period of time. So, but luckily we have means and methods for maintaining those areas. So we were able to go in there and you know clean it up to make it to make to make it look nice and pretty. Um, in terms of the high winds, also if you look to the bottom left. You'll see, like Jaime shared an example of a conic that flipped over. Well, there's another one that ended up in one of our ponds, and it basically obliterated a, a handhold that was in its path. Um, in terms of, of, of soil conditions, the photo in the middle, you'll see a gentleman that's trying to crawl his way, well, crawl his way out of, a, of, of an area. So he got, he, uh, yeah, he was pretty stuck there. And so we have a joke at the lake. Not that anybody would actually really do it, but they ask you, have you ever been baptized? Now, if anybody asks you that, please say no, you're not interested. Because okay. what that means is they'll take you to a little little area like such, and then they, you know, you might find yourself in a similar predicament. Like I said, nobody's actually ever done that, so don't worry. Um, but then uh, another thing is about in terms of weather conditions, extreme cold temperatures. Um, you know, you could have icicles on your crane, and then actually the photo to the bottom right, that's actually during the construction installation of our zonal main line. As you can tell, it was snowing pretty cold, um, and actually with the wind chill factor, I understand it was zero degrees out there. They actually had to cease welding, um, welding, um, welding work just because it was so cold. And then just moving up from that, you see in the, kind of the middle right, you can kind of see a truck there. Well, it, you can't really see it totally just because there's dense fog. Sometimes there could be heavy dense fog, so that can make it a little bit tricky kind of driving around um, those 128 burn, uh, miles of burns and roadways. And up top, I don't know, to me, the guys were kind of laughing at me when I told them I was going to put this picture, but, but you'd actually see, because there's like uh, cattle ranchers like all around the area, so you'll actually find a cow or two maybe in your pathway. So. That's kind of like an interesting thing. But um, but I think to speak a little bit more uh, specifically on those <clears throat> environmental challenges in terms of water. So um, as I mentioned, there's, there's a lot of sediment and organics that um, are present in the water that, we, that runs through the whole main line. We have filtration systems that we try our best to filter out the majority of it. But like I said, during certain times of year, if it's really hot or whatever, we find that stuff is making it past that and continues on through our conveyance system, and then it causes issues out in the field. Um, also, too, with the salts that are naturally occurring in that water, we find that in some of our piping, especially the plastic irrigation piping that we have in North Sanchi, which was in the first phase, that actually there will be calcification, calcium buildup in the line. And obviously, that's not good, it restricts the flows, and then pressure losses and our ability to get water to the different areas for dust control. Um, also, um, okay, so there's that. And in terms of like weather conditions, just basically when the rain don't seem to really be our friends. Uh, you know, they just lead, generally lead to increased maintenance of areas. Um, 
break down the variance, so that's that, that's not that's not um, ideal for us. And then in terms of saline soil conditions, you now I was going to crack a joke that you know salt's great on the state, but it's not so great when it's mixed in your soils because it creates really boggy, boggy working conditions for us to be in. Um, and especially when guys have to walk out like a half a mile or whatever to get into an area, it, it just doesn't make it fun, especially for this gentleman that's in this picture picture right here. And also, what happens with those saline soils? It leads to corrosion of our um, you know, our buried electrical and mechanical equipment. Um, we have a lot of protection to help prevent corrosion, but obviously, you know, it's um, it's a pretty harsh environment. So we that does create issues for us too as well. And um, that's it for me. Okay, thank you. So.